Hello and welcome. I am Professor Rashmi Raman and this is Module 13, War Crimes Part 1. Learning Outcome In this module, you will gain an understanding of the historical development of war crimes. You will learn the concept of war crimes as it is understood in different treaty regimes and in customary international law. You will also understand the common objective requirements of establishing conduct known as war crimes. Let us begin by understanding what war crimes are. A crime that is committed during an armed conflict can be termed broadly as a war crime. An authoritative definition of war crimes was given by the international law jurist Manfred Lacks. Lacks's definition says that war crime is any act of violence qualifying as crime committed during and in connection with a war and under especially favorable conditions created by the war and facilitating its commission, the act being directed against the other belligerent state, its interests or its citizens, against a neutral state, its interests, its citizens, as well as against stateless civilians, unless it is justified under the laws of warfare. More contemporarily, war crimes have been defined as serious violations of international laws applicable in armed conflict, which are punishable under international law. War crimes are connected to international humanitarian law, as the former is just a subset of the latter. That is, war crimes constitute the violation of those rules of international humanitarian law for which there is punishment in the form of individual criminal responsibility. This in fact is the connection between international humanitarian law and international criminal law. Let us look at the history of war crimes. In ancient times, war crimes evolved as violations of the laws of war, which have existed since prehistoric times and whose origins are philosophical. War crimes lie in the difference between a soldier and a mere killer. If an authorized soldier has to differentiate itself from a civilian killer, then it needs to act with honor and to hold itself to a higher standard of behavior. The concept of war crime was present in many ancient civilizations, including the Indian civilization and China. The concept was first developed in the Indian laws of Manu in the 2nd century BC. The laws of Manu list uh, crimes and the laws which are to be observed in a state of war. They require the king to not depart from them. The laws of Manu prohibit the use of concealed weapons, for example, or weapons which are barbed, poisonous or with points blazing with fire. They prohibit attack on the retreating enemy forces, attack on an enemy who is already fighting another, attack on asleep, unarmed, those who have lost their armor, observers and those who are grievously wounded. This underwent, of course, significant changes in medieval times. There are various examples in European history of prosecutions for the violations of laws of war. For instance, Conrandin von Hofenstaufen of Naples was prosecuted in 1268 AD for the instigation of an unjust war and was sentenced to death. Peter von Hagenbach was prosecuted in 1474 for violations of laws of war committed in the village of Breisach. The Dutch jurist Hugo Grotius wrote about individual criminal responsibility for the violation of the laws of war in 1625. Grotius wrote that the fact must be recognized that kings and those who possess rights equal to such kings 
have the right of demanding punishment not only on account of injuries committed against themselves or their subjects, but also on account of injuries which do not directly affect them, but excessively violate the law of nature or of nations in regard to any person whatsoever. From this medieval understanding of Grotius, the laws of war in modern times came to be defined as international humanitarian law in the second half of the 19th century, largely due to the efforts of a Swiss businessman, Henri Dunant, who after witnessing the horrors of the Battle of Solferino made an appeal to reduce unnecessary human suffering in war. As a result, the International Commission for the Red Cross was instituted and various conventions were adopted to regulate and humanize warfare. The first of these conventions was the Geneva Convention on the amelioration of the condition of the wounded in armies in the field, which was adopted in 1864. This was followed by the Hague Conventions of 1899 and 1907, which regulate the means of warfare. While the Hague Conventions recognized that the right of belligerents to adopt means of injuring the enemy is not unlimited, they do not provide individual criminal responsibility for the violation of those provisions. This void was only filled after the Second World War by the adoption of the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, which required the high contracting parties to make provisions for penal sanctions for the grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions. The International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg and Tokyo, which we have discussed in the preceding modules, were the first to provide penal sanctions for the violations of the laws and customs of war. Article 6 of the Charter of the so-called IMT at Nuremberg provides jurisdiction over war crimes. War crimes prosecution were continued in 1994 by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia and the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, both established, of course, by Security Council resolutions that we have discussed in preceding modules. The statutes of both these tribunals provided for jurisdiction over war crimes. In 1998, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court made a significant advancement towards codifying war crimes. This was the development of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court, which is the body established by the Rome Statute, over internal armed conflicts. Article 8 of the Rome Statute provides a list of war crimes, both in international and internal armed conflict. What are these war crimes? The International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg. Article 6 of the Charter of the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, war crimes were defined as follows. Violations of the laws or customs of war. Such violations shall include but not be limited to murder, ill-treatment or deportation to slave labor or for any other purpose of civilian population of or in occupied territory, murder or ill-treatment of prisoners of war or persons on the seas, the killing of hostages, plunder of public or private property, wanton destruction of cities, towns or villages or devastation not justified by military necessity. Please note that this list is not exhaustive. In its judgment, the International Military Tribunal has held that the rules contained 
in the Hague Convention of 1907 had attained the status of customary international law and their violation constituted war crimes not only under treaty but also under customary international law. The four Geneva Conventions of 1949 introduced more war crimes under the chapeau of grave breaches regime. Geneva Convention 1 which is on wounded and sick in armed forces in the field. Geneva Convention 2 on the wounded, sick and shipwrecked of armed forces at sea 1949. Geneva Convention 3 on prisoners of war 1949 and finally Geneva Convention 4 on civilians of 1949 as well as the two additional protocols which were adopted in 1977. These together form the backbone of international humanitarian law. The important development was the grave breaches regime. The four Geneva Conventions together listed some of the acts which would comprise grave breaches of the conventions. And these conventions required that the high contracting parties penalize such grave breaches in their domestic jurisdictions under domestic legislation. For instance, Article 146 of the Geneva Convention 4, that is the protection of civilians, states that the high contracting parties undertake to enact any legislation necessary to provide effective penal sanctions for persons committing or ordering to be committed any of the grave breaches of the present convention defined in the following article. In addition, Article 147 of the 4th Geneva Convention lists these grave breaches as grave breaches to which the preceding article relates shall be those involving any of the following acts if committed against persons or against property protected by the present convention. 1. Willful killing. 2. Torture or inhuman treatment including biological experiments. 3. Willfully causing great suffering or serious injury to body or health. 4. Unlawful deportation or transfer. 5. Unlawful confinement of a protected person. 6. Compelling a protected person to serve in the forces of a hostile power. Or 7. Willfully depriving a protected person of the rights of fair and regular trial prescribed in the present convention. 8. Taking of hostages. 9. Extensive destruction and appropriation of property not justified by military necessity and carried out unlawfully and wantonly. How have the International Criminal Tribunals understood such grave breaches? The ICTY included in its jurisdiction grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions as well as violations of the laws or customs of war. The second category contained a non-exhaustive list of five crimes. The ICTR included in its jurisdiction war crimes committed in internal armed conflicts in the form of serious violations of Article 3 common to the four Geneva Conventions of 1949, two additional protocols of 1977. It produced a non-exhaustive list of eight crimes. The International Criminal Court, how has that defined war crimes? The Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court gives jurisdiction to the International Criminal Court over war crimes. In the context of international armed conflict, it criminalizes the grave breaches of the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 and serious violations of the laws and customs. In the context of internal armed conflict, the Rome Statute 
criminalizes serious violations of Article 3, which is common to the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 and serious violations of the laws and customs of war. The Rome Statute contains an exhaustive list of 50 war crimes, which is by far the most comprehensive list and is unlike others, exhaustive. Although this exhaustiveness is only valid for the purpose of the application of the Rome Statute, it has been argued that the list still does not cover all the laws of war which have been established as customary. This gives rise to the residual category of customary international law. Different treaty regimes have now their own list of war crimes, as we have seen, but those are only lists specific to those treaties and not applicable outside of them. The tribunals were only region specific and the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court is not signed or ratified by all states in the world. Whereas the Geneva Conventions, the four Geneva Conventions of 1949 have been ratified widely, but they do not contain the list of all war crimes and they do not include violations committed in internal armed conflict in the grave breaches regime. Thus, there is a need to identify war crimes which have been recognized as such in the customary international law. As discussed earlier, war crimes are serious violations of the international humanitarian laws. However, it is important to note that not every breach of international humanitarian laws would constitute a war crime. Certain conditions are to be met. In the widely accepted definitions of the ICTY and applied in case law, such as the Tadic case, the appeals chamber laid down the conditions for a violation of international humanitarian law to constitute a war crime. The ICTY appeals chamber decision in Tadic laid out four conditions for identifying a war crime. It took the view that as far as these conditions are met, it should not matter whether the armed conflict in question is an international or an internal armed conflict. The conditions given by the Tadic Appeals Chamber are as follows. Firstly, the crime in question must be a violation of a rule of international humanitarian law. One might assume that this comes from either the Geneva Conventions or from customary international law. Secondly, the rule being violated must be an established custom or if it is a part of a treaty, then the conditions envisaged in the treaty must be met. Thirdly, the violation must be a serious one in that the rule being infringed must be one which protects important values of international humanitarian law. And the violation in question should involve grave consequences for the victim. The Tadic Appeals Chamber gave the example of a loaf from a village by a combatant. It recognized that while the rule under Article 46 Clause 1 of the Hague Convention of 1907, that of protecting private property, is a rule which protects important values, the violation in question does not involve a grave consequence for the victim. This illustration of the theft of a loaf becomes an important benchmark for understanding what is grave. Fourthly, the violation in question must entail under customary or treaty law penal sanctions for the individual perpetrators in, in individual criminal responsibility. Let us now discuss what are the common requirements or the chapeau elements of a war crime. One, the existence of an armed conflict. For a conduct to be deemed as a war crime, it must be a violation of a rule of international humanitarian law. This is something that we have already highlighted in a preceding module. But international humanitarian law only comes into play 
when there exists an armed conflict. The existence of this armed conflict depends on the satisfaction of objective criteria regarding the use or threat of use of force. Thus, the existence of an armed conflict cannot be negated just because one of the belligerents does not recognize the state of war. An international armed conflict exists or can be said to exist whenever there is a state-to-state -state conflict which involves use of force. An international armed conflict also exists in cases of partial or total occupation of the territory of one state by another, even if that occupation is not met with armed resistance. An international armed conflict only ceases on the general close of military operations. The general close of military operations is described as the final end of all fighting between those concerned. This usually is in the form of a ceasefire agreement. The requirements for an internal conflict to exist are a bit different, in that a threshold of intensity and organization is required to be met. The requirement of threshold has been introduced in order to distinguish between armed conflict and mere internal disturbance or civil war. In the famous Tadic case, it was the ICTY appeals chamber once again which stated that an armed conflict exists whenever there is a resort to armed force between states or protracted armed violence between governmental authorities and organized armed groups or between such groups within a state. In the Tadic decision, the appeals chamber had occasion to note the distinction between an internal armed conflict and an international armed conflict. It said that an internal armed conflict exists until a peaceful settlement is achieved. Until that moment, international humanitarian law continues to apply in the whole territory under the control of the parties, whether or not actual combat takes place during the du entire duration. What is the nexus of armed conflict with war crimes? According to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, for the conduct to be deemed as a war crime, it has to be committed in the context of and associated with an armed conflict. The term context here implies that the conduct in question takes place in the same temporal and geographical sense as the armed conflict. Thus, the conduct should be carried out during an armed conflict and in the same territory as the warring parties are geographically or spatially located. The trial chamber of the ICTY in the Kunarak case stated that the nexus requirement does not require that the offences be directly committed whilst fighting is actually taking place or at the actual scene of combat. Humanitarian law continues to apply in the whole of the territory under the control of one or both of the parties, whether or not actual combat continues at the place where the events are transpiring. The requirement or the chapeau requirement of the term associated with is similar to the term closely related with, both of which jurisprudential trains come from the ICTY. In the Kunarak decision, the trial chamber of the ICTY stated as follows. The requirement that the act be closely related to the armed conflict is satisfied if, as in the present case, the crimes are committed in the aftermath of the fighting and until the cessation of combat activities in a certain region and are committed in furtherance or take advantage of the situation created by the fighting. In conclusion, in this module, we have learned about the historical origins of war crimes. We have appreciated how this category of crime has developed through the jurisprudence 
of the ICTY and the ICTR. We have also looked how it has evolved from the ancient period through the medieval period to the modern definition. We have looked at the definition given to war crimes under different treaty regimes and also identified the discrete rules of customary international law regarding war crimes. Finally, we have looked at some common objective requirements or chapeau requirements which are to be met before a conduct in question can be deemed as a war crime by a court. Thank you.